The Knights Templar are enduring figures of myth and mystery that are still recognizable 700 years after their demise. We all know the scene in the popular movie Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, in which a Templar knight guards the legendary Holy Grail. But who were the real Knights Templar, and what happened to them? Before we get into what happened to the Knights Templar, let's find out a bit more about who they were in the first place. By the 11th century, Europe had fully embraced Christianity. Since the 7th century, a new Abrahamic religion called Islam had gained traction, and its Muslim followers had been expanding and taking control of sites that they considered to be holy. As these sites were also regarded as sacred to Christianity, the European Christians began to take umbrage to the Muslim expansion. By the end of the 11th century, the Turks were seizing territories belonging to the Byzantine Empire, and in 1095, Byzantine Emperor Alexios Komnenos appealed to Pope Urban II for help. Seeing this as an opportunity to make a play for the Holy Land, the Pope encouraged Western Christians to come to the aid of the Byzantines and recapture the Holy Land in the process. People across Europe responded, and both those with combat experience and ordinary citizens joined the armed pilgrimage. The Crusades had begun. After years of fighting, on June 7, 1099, the Christian forces laid siege to Jerusalem. The Fatimid Caliphs of Cairo, who controlled Jerusalem, believed that the reduced Christian forces had no hope of succeeding. Jerusalem was well supplied, and they expected a relief force would soon arrive from Egypt. In contrast, the Christian army was short of supplies and had already lost some troops. However, by July 15, the Christian forces under Godfrey of Bouillon had erected siege towers and entered the city. The governor surrendered and was escorted from the city. Sadly, orders to allow sanctuary in the Aqsa Mosque were ignored, leading to the slaughter of thousands of Muslims and Jews. With Jerusalem now under Christian control, pilgrims across Europe began visiting the Holy Land. However, the Christians' hold on the area was rather tenuous, and as most crusaders had returned home, Jerusalem was far from secure. Unfortunately for the pilgrims, they also had to pass through Muslim-controlled territory to get there, which resulted in many of them being robbed, killed, or both. In around 1119, a group of eight or nine French knights led by Hugh de Pena took a vow to protect the Christian pilgrims traveling to the Holy Land in response to those ongoing killings. They aimed to set up a religious community to protect pilgrims, and they were given lodgings in a wing of the royal palace of Baldwin II, formerly the site of the Temple of Solomon. The Band of Knights adopted the name the Poor Knights of Christ and of the Temple of Solomon, and over time they became known as the Knights Templar. The small group refused to admit new members for the first nine years, preferring the small, close-knit circle. The Knights lived as monks, and their lifestyle was modeled after the rule of St. Benedict. This rule was one of moderation. All must be given its due, but only its due. They swore oaths of poverty, chastity, and obedience, and renounced the world in the same way as other monastic orders. They honored the feasts and fasts of the monastic calendar and were not allowed to drink alcohol, gamble, or swear. They lived as a community, sleeping together in a dormitory and eating all their meals together. However, unlike other monks, their primary purpose was fighting. Their military objective drew criticism from those who opposed the idea of religious armed forces but they did have the support of many religious leaders. In 1129, the Knights Templar realized that for the organization to survive, they needed to admit new members, and on January 13th, they traveled to Europe to seek funding and recruits. They were well received by many nobles and were given generous donations for their cause. Their fame grew when they won the endorsement of Bernard of Clairvaux, who was later canonized as Saint Bernard. Bernard defended the order in his book In Praise of the New Knighthood, which spread the news of the Knights Templar and helped them gain new members. As the order grew, so did their duties, and they were soon enlisted as defenders against Muslim attacks in Spain as well as in the Holy Land. They no longer just defended traveling pilgrims. They began building castles, participating in battles, and fortifying important towns. In 1139, Pope Innocent II issued a papal order that granted the knights special privileges and declared them to be subjects of the Pope, which made them exempt from episcopal jurisdiction. During the 1200s, the order had expanded far beyond the simple and small group that had founded it. 
the organization now needed structure and a formal constitution from which to work. At its head was the Grand Master, a member who, once elected, held the position for life and served from Jerusalem, which was still the main focus of the order. Under the Grand Master, the Templar territories were divided into provinces governed by a commander. Under these commanders were the preceptors in charge of the individual Templar houses, called preceptories. The Templars were generally divided into two classes, elite knights and the serving class of sergeants. The knights wore the distinctive long white surcoat emblazoned with a red cross, and they were usually from the military aristocracy, having been trained in the art of war. The knights held leadership titles within the order, as well as significant positions in various courts. The sergeants dressed in black monks' robes and were known as the Serving Brothers since they came from poorer backgrounds. Most of the order comprised this lower social rank, and they both fought alongside and acted as servants for the knights. To join the Templars, members had to sign all their wealth and goods over to the organization. Most joined for life, taking vows of obedience, piety, chastity, and poverty, although some were allowed to participate for a set period. Eventually, the Templars added a class whose sole purpose was the religious aspect of the order, and there were records of at least one Templar nunnery. However, women were not allowed to join the order officially. There are many enduring myths of the Templars, including that they had found religious artifacts during their time at Temple Mount. Amongst them are the Holy Grail, the Turin Shroud, the Head of John the Baptist, the Spear of Destiny, the Embalmed Head of Jesus Christ, and the location of the Ark of the Covenant. By the end of the 12th century, the Christians and the Knights Templar had been ousted from the Holy Land, leading many to believe that the Knights took their secret finds with them when they left. The Siege of Acre in 1291, where the armies of the Mamluk Sultan Khalil finally defeated the last Christian outpost in the Holy Land, signaled the beginning of the end of the Knights Templar. As the Knights had gained popularity, they had also gained wealth and power. As well as the riches and properties donated by members, the order had been gifted feudal lordships, estates, and castles by the kings and prominent nobles of Europe. Their military strength and vast network allowed them to safely collect, transport, and store treasures and money, which meant that they could act as bankers for the nobility, royalty, and traveling pilgrims. Even after their main purpose was lost after Muslims took control of the Holy Land, the Knights Templar was still a wealthy and powerful organization within Europe which aroused the resentment of the nobility and royalty. Support of the knights, once classed as heroes and revered throughout Europe, quickly diminished. The first blow to their security was the death of Pope Boniface VIII in 1303, who had praised the knights, calling them fearless warriors of Christ. Boniface had clashed with the French King Philip over taxes and even threatened to excommunicate the king. This conflict led to Boniface being captured by Philip, after which he died perhaps due to mistreatment while imprisoned. Boniface was replaced by Clement V, who was far more agreeable to Philip. Around 1305, a former member of the Templars accused the order of blasphemy and immorality, which may have allowed Philip a way to take the Templars down. It is unknown why King Philip targeted the Templars, but it is generally accepted that he desired their wealth and properties. Philip had a history of going after wealthy groups, he had arrested a group of wealthy Italian merchants, called the Lombards, in 1292 and confiscated the properties of around 100,000 French Jews in 1306, before he turned his sights on the prominent and unexpecting Templars. Around December 1306, Pope Clement contacted the Templars' Grand Master, Jacques de Molay. He asked him to travel to France under the pretense of discussing the possibility of launching another crusade to the Holy Land. Early in 1307, de Molay and around 60 knights traveled to France and spent several months in meetings discussing the supposed crusade. Unbeknownst to the Templars, the French king began using agents to circulate rumors about the Templars. Spies also infiltrated the order's ranks, encouraging former members to implicate the Templars in unscrupulous activities. Using the rumors and accusations as a reason to act, on Friday, October 13, 1307, Philip organized dawn raids to round up and arrest over 600 Knights Templar in France. Using the judicial procedure for heresy, known as Inquisitions, Philip confiscated Templar properties and used torture to extract confessions from the Knights. Not only were the Knights arrested, but so was anyone with connections with the Order, 
including bankers, farmers, and administrators. Philip accused the Templars of heresy to invoke practices of torture allowed under inquisitorial questioning. The crimes listed against them included idol worship of a bearded male head who was said to have great power, worship of a cat, and homosexuality. It was also claimed that, as part of a secret initiation rite, a new member was required to deny Christ three times, spit on a crucifix, and be kissed at the base of his spine, his navel, and his lips by a presiding knight. Within weeks, the Templars had been forced to confess under pain of torture. The Templars were kept isolated and fed meager rations, and they were held suspended by their wrists, which were tied behind their backs, causing their shoulders to dislocate. Many were kept in pits no wider than a single footstep, or had their feet burnt by hot oil or fire. Under these conditions, it is unsurprising that many pleaded guilty to the charges simply to stop the torture. In other countries, the Templars were declared innocent of all charges, but due to pressure from Philip, Pope Clement ordered that all Templar properties throughout Europe should be confiscated. Knights who confessed were sent to retirement in monasteries, and those who refused to were imprisoned. Many, including de Molay, who confessed under horrendous conditions and later recanted his confession, were burned at the stake. In the following years, it was generally accepted that all the charges levied against the Knights Templar were false. In the 18th century, an organization called the Freemasons formed, claiming that the knowledge of the Templars had been secretly passed down. During the French Revolution, it is said that a Freemason dipped a cloth in the blood of Louis XVI and shouted, Jacques de Molay, you are avenged! In the 20th century, it was postulated that the image of Jesus Christ on the Shroud of Turin was the head that the Templars were accused of worshipping. Despite the tragic end of the Knights Templar, their legacy and legend live on today, and these enigmatic figures are still used in popular fiction, adding to the myth and mystery of the Order. How would you like to get a deeper understanding of history, impress your friends, and predict the future more accurately based on past events? If this sounds like something you might be into, then check out the brand new Captivating History Book Club by clicking the first link in the description. To learn more about history, check out our Captivating History book series. It's available as ebooks, paperbacks, and audiobooks. If you found the video captivating, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.